All right, I'm going to go ahead and start just a few seconds early, just to, just to get rolling here because time is very precious. It's uh, always hard to get in everything that we want to say. So this is a class on the Sermon on the Mount, and we are uh, talking about this with the hopes that it will inspire us to not just understand that, but to really delve into the, the mind of Jesus as he's revealing these truths to the people of, of his day. And, and we began last week going through uh, these slides and talking about our, our class goals and, and objectives. And we're not going to review all of those again with you, but just kind of remember that, that we're trying to be purposeful as we go through our class, and so these are some of the goals that I have established for us, just to kind of give you a, a sense of where I want us to go, and the sense of where I, uh, things that I would like for us to accomplish. Um, and anybody who wants uh, these slides available after class, just ask me, and I'll send those to you, uh, and we'll make those available to you. Um, but as you think about those things, as we dive deep into the Sermon on the Mount, I'll keep those things in mind. So we left, left off last week talking about where the Sermon on the Mount belongs in the overall scheme of the Gospel of Matthew. And we talked about this in terms of Matthew being a uh, unique Gospel. You know, we, we kind of lump him in with the other synoptics, I think, unfairly. Um, but Matthew... In, in terms of his standout, he is the one who focuses primarily on these five teaching blocks. These act as the, the, the support and the pillars of the entire gospel, as you think about it, as he's talking about it. Everything, as you go through Matthew, kind of revolves around these five major teaching blocks. The Sermon on the Mount is the first one. And it's the most memorable one as well. Matthew knew what he was doing. And as we talk about this, uh, one of the things I want as one of our goals was to observe Matthew's intentional <clears throat> design as he was going through and revealing this particular gospel. And, and, and the design that we see here in these five teaching blocks really tells a, a big part of the story. But to, to understand that the Sermon on the, on the Mount is the introductory teaching block is really going to be helpful for us as we think about uh, the, uh, how Matthew structures this gospel. So today I, I want to go and continue with our uh, introduction to this and give background materials, and it may seem like that's a little much, but... It's going to set the table for us to really have a complete understanding of these things. Now, I, I typically like to present a little bit of a thought question for you to be ruminating as we go through things. So what I want you to be thinking about uh, over the next couple of minutes is the expression the kingdom of heaven or the concept of a kingdom itself. And, and I want you to share with the class in just a few moments the idea of what the kingdom means to you or what the kingdom of heaven, what images are drawn in your mind or what, uh, what comes to your heart when you think about the expression, the kingdom of heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Now, in terms of introduction, Matthew is very persistent in this point. He wants to demonstrate that Jesus has come as a fulfillment of prophecy. And he's very deliberate in that in the first four chapters <coughs> leading up to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, beginning in the very first chapter with the genealogy. The genealogy really expresses uh, the fact that here's the one we've been looking for. Now, when you understand the audience that Matthew is talking to, and, and tell me, who is the audience? Who is the audience? Jewish people. He's talking to the Jewish people, the, the Jews of the first century, and 
Uh, in particular, uh, how, about, how would you describe the people who were gathered uh, for the hearing of the Sermon on the Mount, these other teaching blocks? How, how would you describe them? They were just curious who this prophet, this healer was. All right, they would be curious for sure that their lives are not occupied with other matters, right? What does that tell you about them? Are these important people? Some were. Some were. Yeah. Largely, the people who are, are beginning to be attracted to Jesus early on are people who don't have a whole lot going on in their lives. They're trying to make it in life. They're, they're looking for something for sure. They're looking for hope that they do not have. They don't have a lot of political clout or power. They are people who are just kind of scraping by. Largely, that is the audience that we're going to be talking about. We'll develop that a little bit more as we go along. So as, as, as you think about Matthew introducing this idea of here's the one who is coming in prophecy, he's talking to the common Jewish people of his day. People who had a notion of what they're looking for, the Messiah. Uh, and, and they are welcoming the idea of that. And so when Matthew begins this, and he begins talking about the fact that Jesus is fulfilling prophecy, he, he starts quoting all of these passages of Scripture. Like in Matthew 1, 22, he quotes Isaiah and said, Behold, the virgin will bring forth his son. What's Matthew saying? What's, what's the point of him saying that Jesus is coming, fulfilling all of these prophecies? And, and we can just continue down the list and add these. Um, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. And you, Bethlehem, out, out uh, of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people. And Matthew says this was to fulfill this prophecy. This was to fulfill this prophecy. This was to fulfill this prophecy. All of this, just as an introductory manner of, of him coming to this point of the Sermon on the Mount. Hosea, out of Egypt did I call my son. So he's, he's bringing up Isaiah. He's bringing up Micah. He's bringing up Hosea. He's, he's bringing up Jeremiah in chapter 2. 17 and 18, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. He's talking about the, the killing of the male children there in the time of Jesus. This was according to prophecy. And these are the major prophets that he talks about. Again, uh, he shall be called the Nazarene. He said this was according to prophecy. We don't have that exact terminology used in any of the prophets, except that Nazarene was understood to be a place that was despised, and there's a lot said about the Messiah who would come and be despised. Uh, Isaiah 53, uh, most notably in that regard. Also Psalm 22. Again in Isaiah, uh, the prophet uh, speaks of John the baptizer, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. All of this is laying the groundwork, you see, for this time, and again in Isaiah, in chapter 4. Leading up to the Sermon on the Mount, verses 16 and 17, the land of Zebulun and Ned, Ned, uh, Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee, the people saw this great light, and upon them a light dawned. So all of these things, all of these prophecies are, are, um, are being revealed so that he can make this, this large point. He's the one we're looking for. Tell me what it what it does for you to see all of those statements here early in, in the Gospel of Matthew. It says this was according to prophecy. What does that do to you? What 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 impression does that make of you? What is Matthew trying to accomplish? using Old Testament witnesses to prove who this person is. All right. So it's telling us that these are people who, who know the prophets, right, and who have placed their confidence in the prophecies. And so now 
Matthew is building a very strong case about who this Jesus is who's come. And he is the fulfillment of prophecy. So this is huge. This is tremendous. All right? And this is how Matthew introduces Jesus. This is the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Now, next point. Matthew makes this other illustration. It becomes obvious here in the first few chapters of Matthew as well. And his point is that Jesus is the new Moses. Who's Moses to these people, these first century Jews? He's everything. He's the, the one who came giving the law. He is the, he is the great leader of their nation. He, he is the one who is, in many ways, the, the intermediary uh, between God and the people. They, they, he is, occupies an elevated position in the mind of the people. And so for Matthew to make these points and, and draw these comparisons between Jesus and Moses, it's remarkable. For, for example, in uh, Matthew 2, uh, we have the occasion where Herod is killing all of the male children. Does that harken back to another time? Wasn't it? Yeah. During the, the, the infancy <laughs> and childhood of Moses, that Pharaoh was killing the male children. And then in Matthew 2, verses 14 and 15, out of Egypt, that was even the, that prophecy that we quoted just a moment ago. You know, it's from Egypt that, that Moses comes as well. Um, and he uh, uh, is, is demonstrating again. Here is Jesus looking like Moses. His baptism in the wilderness in, in Matthew, the third chapter, harkens also back to the baptism of the... Israelites in, uh, in the wilderness. So they were baptized in the sea. Even 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and verse 2. Maybe that's a stretch, making that point there. But uh, I needed to fill up the slot. <laughs> How long did the children of Israel wander in the wilderness? 40 years. How long did Jesus spend in the wilderness? In 40 days. 40 units of time. That's interesting. How long did Moses stay on Mount Sinai to receive the law? 40 days. 40 days. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to think about that. As uh, And we're told that Moses did not eat or drink anything during that time up on the mountain. And Jesus is experiencing hunger as well in the wilderness where he is fasting. <coughs> um, so a very clear parallel uh, is made there between uh, uh, Jesus and Moses. And then finally, that the law would, would come forth from the mountain. The law of Moses came from Mount Sinai. And here, Matthew, Matthew makes a point of saying, Jesus went to the mountain. And he sits down and he begins to talk. So the law is coming from the mountain. So these very interesting parallels are coming forward. Yes, Gary. Another one is that the king, Moses, or Christ brought them out of captivity. Yeah, yeah. we can I mean, continue. That's kind of important to understand. Yeah, these, I think these parallels become really interesting. But Matthew is very specific, though, and intentional, it mm -hmm. seems to me, mm -hmm. in presenting Jesus as the new Moses, who's bringing the law, and it's coming from the mountain. And all of these interesting uh, new things are, are occurring now. So that is interesting to me. Now, the kingdom of heaven. What images or what thoughts come in your mind with that expression, the kingdom of heaven? Here. Kingdoms were created by man to protect the people, <laughs> and that's what a king does. And that's what God did to his people, still does to his people, is protect them and guide them and yeah. provide for them. Great, yeah. So kingdoms are in, in place for a purpose, for order, for, uh, for the, uh, the good of society in general. Yeah. Well, when I think of a kingdom, a king is required. You need a king. There has to be a king over the kingdom, for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Into and it's his domain where he rules. It's his rules, his ways. That's right. It implies that he's the king, he's the ruler, he's the one who has the authority. <coughs> kingdom. Kingdom. 
It's interesting. Yeah, Steve. I, I think of security because every time you think of a kingdom, I always think of a place that's got a wall around it where mm -hmm. the, the king lives and people live within that yeah. protection. Were, were the people that, that Jesus talking to anticipating the coming of a kingdom? Yes. Yes, they were. Some, some were. Yeah. Yeah, and, there are, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute. There are a whole lot of ideas about what that meant. But the prophets were clear that there was going to be a kingdom. For example, in Daniel, the second chapter, verse 44, and Daniel 7, verse 27, Daniel has these visions where he <laughs> sees the kingdom of God come and bring an end to all of the other world kingdoms that he, he prophesied about, the, the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and then the Roman Empire. And in the days of those kings, he says in, in, in Daniel 2, God will establish his kingdom. And this kingdom in, in chapter 7 of Daniel, verse 27, would be occupied by the saints of God, he says. So that kind of prophetic imagery would be branded in the minds and the hearts of these people as they're anticipating a kingdom. Yes, Kansas. So when they first started out, God was their king, right before yeah. they wanted a king. Like, mm -hmm. How does that fit in? Yeah. So uh, God was somewhat disappointed with them when they cried out for a king, wasn't he? It, it seems. He had made provisions for it, but, <coughs> but uh, Samuel was praying to God in disappointment. They're crying out for a king. They don't, they don't want the judges to rule over them as we have. And they, they, they don't even want me as the prophet and the priest uh, to, to be leader over them. And God says, Samuel, they, they haven't rejected you. They reject me. They want to be like the kingdoms around them. But then God allowed it, and God made provisions for that. And then he used that very concept of a kingdom to prepare the hearts of the people to receive the true king, the one king, the king in the lineage of David, as, as that would all unfold. And so the people's hearts were very much in tune to that the son of David who would come and and, and, and bring and usher in this new kingdom. And so this is huge. And Jesus seizes upon this, and we can actually look at Matthew, the fourth chapter, and look at verse 17. This is after all of these introductory things. This is after his baptism. Uh, he is beginning his ministry now. And thematically, this is what Matthew says is what Jesus is all about. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah, and I think that if, if we were to point to one verse that is the theme of the entire gospel of Matthew, this is it. This is it. And what does he mean when he says, repent? Change. Jesus is ushering in change. And you are going to have to accommodate yourself to that change. You've got to change the way that you think. You've got to change, in, as a matter of fact, as we discover in the Sermon on the Mount, you have to change your identity in so many ways. If you go to verse 23 of chapter 4, it says, And Jesus was going about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. That was his theme. And Matthew draws that out as, as the theme of, of the coming of Jesus and the message of Jesus. Change your hearts, change your ways, change your thinking, because the good news of the gospel is coming, it is at hand. And then he starts the Sermon on the Mount, and what happens? It comes out of his mouth in the first sentence. 
The very first sentence of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's completely unexpected. That's completely upside down. That is completely um, un, un, uh, counterintuitive. That? Counterintuitive. That's the word. That's the word. That's the phrase I'm looking for. Uh, the people who were poor, destitute, hopeless, are the first to be invited to the kingdom that he's coming to. The fishermen trying to scrape by a living, who were living in their ancestral lands, but it really wasn't theirs. They're paying exorbitant taxes that they can't afford. The day laborers who are just trying to provide food for their family day by day are hearing these words of Jesus and hearing this invitation to be part of this kingdom. <coughs> the prostitutes and the sex workers are hearing this message. The powerless, the unimportant, the, the politically unconnected, the disenfranchised. <laughs> These are the first to be invited to the kingdom. This is so consistent with Jesus and what he does. That's it, unexpected. Who was the first one that we know of that Jesus announced himself as the Messiah? In Samaria, a woman who had been married a number of times at the well. He's, Jesus is announcing he's the Messiah first to that person? It, unthinkable. But that's what Jesus does. He changes things. These are revolutionary thoughts. These are revolutionary actions and ideas. And so the beginning of the Beatitudes and then and the conclusion of the Beatitudes in verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Who are the fortunate ones? The ones who are persecuted. Who, who are the ones that have the good life? These who are persecuted. <coughs> Why? Because they have the kingdom. And so this theme of the kingdom of heaven, and I think I've, I've given you a few statistics here. In Matthew, the first seven chapters, this expression, the kingdom of heaven, is found at least seven times. Other concepts of it are, are there as well. Seven times. So when something is repetitive of that, that nature and it jumps out with that type of repetition, that tells you that this is a major theme, the kingdom of heaven. And you go through the entire gospel of Matthew, I counted 31 times the kingdom of heaven. That expression is used. I read another author who counted 32. He probably got it right. I probably missed one. 32 times the expression kingdom of heaven is found in the gospel of Matthew. Where else do you find the expression kingdom of heaven? Nowhere. That shocked me when I discovered that. <clears throat> now, that theme is loaded through Mark and Luke as well. Because they talk a lot about the kingdom of God. And it's the same thing for sure. But Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. Does that give you a different flavor for what <coughs> Matthew is saying? Or a different emphasis that Matthew is bringing when he talks about the kingdom? Kingdom of heaven? How is the kingdom of heaven different than the kingdom of God? It's not different. But it's a different emphasis. Like it's, it's not of this earth. Like it's, yeah, like it's, not removed, it's, removed. it's not of this earth, right? You know, it. You know what it does to me? It makes me think about when <clears throat> God created the world and the Spirit moved over the face of the waters. So this is God saying it's void, it's empty. But I'm going to, I'm going to take part of me and put it on the earth. 
heaven and earth are going to meet. And, and there you have it in the Garden of Eden. You have the kingdom of God there. In the garden. It's all perfect. God's in fellowship with his creation. They walk together in the cool of the day. <coughs> they're in communication. They're in fellowship. It's perfect. That's the kingdom of heaven. God's abode has come to earth. And it's paradise. It's wonderful. It's perfect. That ends. In some amount of time. We don't know how much time. But that ends. And the rest of the Bible is descriptive of how we're going to get back to that place of paradise. And how God is going to work through the descendants of Adam and through the descendants of Noah, through the descendants of Abraham to accomplish this purpose. And that story unfolds of how God is going to, is going to get heaven to meet with earth again. And Matthew describes that as the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus' words, <clears throat> it is near and it's coming and it belongs to you, wretched people who are listening to me here at the Sermon on the Mount. You are invited to be in this kingdom. And so then you go to chapter 5, verse 19. And we find Jesus saying here in the Sermon on the Mount, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> but whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Three times in these three verses, this expression kingdom of heaven is used again where Jesus is clearly defining the relationship that he has with the law of Moses. Some are saying, well, you must be coming to destroy the law of Moses. And he says, not at all. You do not believe that accusation. That's not what's happening here. I have come to fulfill. Make it full to, to fullness is the idea of that. And so if Matthew 4 and verse 17 is a theme verse for the entire gospel of Matthew. I would sub submit to you that Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, is the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. And this coming kingdom that he is defining and uh, helping us to understand. We continue in the Sermon on the Mount to chapter 6 and verse 7. We find it there again. Yes, Ken. Real quick, two things. Um, one, <coughs> Matthew, consider the writer of this. As he's hearing these words and he's saying, blessed are the poor and blessed are the, the forgotten. Blessed are the ones, like you said, that have been marginalized or even criticized or, or turned from. Matthew, the tax collector. You know, the person who is out in front of his people, in their eyes, betraying them, working for the other team. Yeah. You know, that'd be like, Brett going around to all the members and collecting money to give to Florida State football. <laughs> Very odd thing to do. We would all go, all the Gator fans go, what are doing right now? Imagine that, hearing that as Matthew. And then as far as kingdom of heaven, I have two words come to mind for me. It might say a lot about me, but peace and promise. And as you mentioned, every example of true peace was always temporary. Yeah. The temporary peace in the garden temporary peace after the destruction of the earth through the flood temporary peace every time that, they, <coughs> that the remnant was restored and brought back but the kingdom of heaven is the promise of a permanent lasting, lasting peace yeah. Yeah. yes it's his rest absolutely. Right? what's that? it's his rest it's, it's, it's absolutely it is the rest you, you know what thrills me about this class so far that when I said kingdom nobody said church it is. The kingdom is the church, by the way. But we've so perverted our notion of what the church is. That sometimes it doesn't feel like a rest. <laughs> that it doesn't feel like a rest. We'd say church and we think, this bunch of imperfect, crazy people coming together and making all of this problem for me. Stressing me out. 
And blessed are those. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. so, I, you know, I grew up understanding that the kingdom was the church. And then when Jesus promised the coming of the kingdom, he was promising to establish his church on the day of Pentecost. And that's true. All of that is true. But that's not how we think about that in its best form, in my opinion. Did I say I'm going to share some opinions with you in this class? I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. All right. Uh, continuing this, this theme of the kingdom of heaven, you go over to chapter 6 and verse 10, it's in the Lord's Prayer. He said, um, thy kingdom come. I'm going to say the kingdom of heaven. Do I have five minutes? Is that what you're telling me? Five minutes? <coughs> something happens. Some, something happens. All right. Um, so this thing continues. Uh, and then chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And then chapter 7, verse 21, Lord, Lord, not those who say Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven and he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So that, I just wanted to say, that thematically shows up all the way through uh, the Sermon on the Mount as well. I wanted to read a quote from Paul Earnhardt's book. I'm not going to do that right now. We'll save that for another time. And, um, all right. Do I have time? No, probably don't. But let's, let's, let's start. I want you to think about the, this time in which Jesus lived. We talked uh, about the fact that there were, there were major sects of uh, philosophy and thinking among the Jews and how they anticipated receiving the kingdom. That's what I wanted to point out with, with this section here. So we have the Pharisees. This is, this is one of the most recognized among all of these philosophies. And they had the philosophy about the coming kingdom, and that is we need to purify the people. The people need to get back to the Torah, back to the law. And so they're focused on having this moral and legal purity so that the nation of Israel can, in righteousness, receive the kingdom that God is coming or is bringing. And so they're focused on enforcing and teaching the law with utmost devotion to every detail. They were considered by many to be extremists who were focused on heavenly authority. They were the religious conservatives of the day. We also have the Essenes. The Essenes were the ones who who uh, we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in their area. They had isolated themselves off to purify. They were separatists. You might, you might think of them like the, the Amish of the day. They, they said, we're not going to participate in society. We're going to have our own society. And it's from this society that the kingdom will come. And then we have the Sadducees. The Sadducees said, well, here's how the kingdom is going to come. The kingdom is going to come because we're going to cooperate with the powerful people. We're going to cooperate with Rome. I mean, we're going to accomplish kingdom power by cooperating with this Roman occupation. And we're going to negotiate to achieve power and relevance within the status quo. And they're going to be the political power brokers in Israel. They're the ones through whom the priesthood is going to come. They're the ones who are in control of the temple and, and all of that. The Sadducees. And then there are the zealots. The zealots said, we've got to help God along with this process. So what we're going to do is, we are going to receive the kingdom because we're going to crush God's enemies. That's what we're going to do. We're going to eradicate the enemies of God. And so they were in favor of political and physical violence to overthrow Rome. They were the insurrectionists of their day. And so the kingdom is going to appear by actions of revolutionary violence. I want you to think about all of those philosophies. And some of those philosophies, we can say Jesus could identify with. We've been using this term revolutionary quite a bit, haven't we? Jesus would be in favor of us coming out from among them and being separate. Je Jesus would be considered a religious conservative in many ways. But of all of those philosophies, who do you think 
who do you think is most like Jesus, or which would you say has a philosophy that is most in line with the philosophy of Jesus? None. None? None? No, most. I want you to give me one who's most like Jesus. One of those Pharisees. Because the way, the way they saw it was right, but the level they were working on was not high enough. Okay. I, I agree with that, by the way. Any other thoughts on that? I know the, the, the buzzer just went off, so we're going to include class in just a moment, but any other thoughts? Well, the Sadducees uh, said, oh, no, we're going to cooperate. Well, like Jesus said, yo, give to Caesar what yep. Caesar's yep. Yep. God, what's you, God. You can, find, you can find philosophies of Jesus in all of these, is uh-huh. my point. But the one I think that most resembles the philosophy of Jesus is the Pharisees. When you look at it. That identifies Jesus pretty well. The second part of the question is, who did Jesus reserve the most criticism for? The Pharisees. The one he's closest to. The Pharisees. What? The ones who what, should have understood the best. What insight? What insight does that provide for us? Shaking our boots. <laughs> I just want to say one more sentence. <laughs> I'm maybe three sentences. I'm, like all of us, further along in my maturity as a Christian and as a leader than I've ever been. And I discovered that my most fervent criticism comes to people who I share things in common with but I think are missing the point badly. And I think that makes me resemble Jesus in some way. I'll just, another opinion. That's, that's a bold statement. No proofs. <laughs> that, that's a bold statement that I just made. So I, I wanted to leave class on that statement and want you to think more about that and come and bring your comments about that uh, next week. All right? All right, thank you.